Welcome to the curiosity of a child. First year anniversary. Yay! We're a year old, mate. Mm hmm. Yeah. Do you think we'd make it this far? Um, well, yeah, probably. <laughs> and have you enjoyed it? Yeah. And me. We've had a few moments, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Creative conflicts. But I think you've done very, very well. Yeah. And so do other people, because we're actually going to feed our egos a bit and read some reviews, aren't we? <laughs> yep. Do you want to read the first one? No. No? Okay. <laughs> the first one's from Ned Donovan. And he says, What a podcast! Sometimes ideas hit the perfect connection between intent and execution. And this is one of those. A must listen. Pretty good? Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got another one here by James. Do you want to read this one? Okay. This is a fantastic podcast. I love the relationship between father and son. The educational journeys that they take really do transport you back to when you were learning about castles or Egypt. I have also suggested um, that my partner, who is a teacher, recommends it to her primary school students. That's right, we might actually be on the curriculum in schools across all lands. Yay! And we actually had a review from France the other day, which I liked. And this is from Marin. Wakes up the curious child in you. Oh, wait, I need my French accent. Oh, la la. <laughs> Wakes up the curious child in you. That's not French. Well, it's the best I can do, okay? <laughs> okay. Quite interesting facts. I like the way the stories are brought so anyone can understand it easily, which is a plus for a non-native English speaker. So thank you very much for that one. Mm -hmm. And we've got one more. Do you want to try reading this one? So this is from... Pretty good. <laughs> and they sent a poop emoji, space invader emoji, alien head emoji, eye emoji, and brain emoji. And then said, Who? <laughs> when you have nothing to listen to. Yep, so thank you very much. And uh, they still rated us four out of five. Yeah, that's so good. So how many hours of um, podcast do you think we've created? I think we've created overall about eight hours of podcast. More than that, over nine. And this will actually take oh, us up so to ten good. hours this episode. And I reckon we've probably got about 22 trillion words. <laughs> that was spoken using my amazing math skills which you know from my Halloween episode or our Halloween episode rather yeah do you think you've learnt lots? yeah I've learnt um, how to do brain surgery I've learnt that you're terrible at maths <laughs> I've learnt about more things okay anyway with that out of the way should we get on with the show? yeah on with the show so you've been looking at painting pigments at school, haven't you? Yeah, it's been our homework. So what is colour? Um, it's just light, isn't it? That's right. In 1704, Sir Isaac Newton published a book called Optics, and it contained the first ever colour wheel. <laughs> and I've got a painting of him here, and what's he holding? He's holding a prism, and the light's being refracted. Being refracted into its different wavelengths, yeah. Yeah. And it's making it like a rainbow. We've got a prism, haven't we? Yeah. And what do you notice about the colour that you get from a prism? The colours are very like bold, strong colours. Exactly, they're pure though, aren't they? Mm -hmm. When Sir Isaac Newton made his first colour wheel and was looking at light, it was actually during an outbreak of the bubonic plague. <laughs> so he was isolating at the time. Yeah. So a bit like we, or many people are right now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we're lucky in Guernsey that we don't need to. Yeah, not too much, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder what other discoveries people are doing right now. Yeah. So there's his book there, which is called Optics, or a treatise on the reflections and refractions, inflections and colours of light. Also two treatises on species and magnitude of curvilinear figures. And we have a picture of that in the show notes. So would you like to see his colour wheel? Yes, please. Okay, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Be prepared to be amazed. What's missing? colour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so Isaac Newton's colour wheel had no colour. But we know that colour isn't a wheel, is it? It's a linear scale measuring the wavelength of light from red to violet. But one of the colours is missing, isn't it? Yes. Pink. Yeah, and why is that? 
Because pink isn't a colour. Yeah, pink kind of doesn't exist in a way. Because if light goes from red to violet, there is no pink. Mm -hmm. Different colours become visible when a photon, that's a particle of light, of just the right wavelengths hits something, okay? Yeah. Then the colour you see isn't actually within the object itself. What you're actually seeing is the light being reflected back. Mm -hmm. And then the other wavelengths of colour will be absorbed. So like your top that you've got on at the moment is red. Yeah. That means that when light's hitting it, the red wavelengths of light are being bounced back to our eyes. Yeah. And all the other colours or wavelengths of light are being absorbed actually so, by the material. So what you're trying to say is my T-shirt is any colour but red. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like to think of it that way. I like to think that it's absorbing the colour that it is. Mm -hmm. So with pink, what you're actually seeing is two wavelengths of light red and violet at the same time. Yeah. And then your eyes kind of making sense. And this is also why black things get hot in the sun, because they absorb most of the light or the energy yeah. um, that's hitting them and it gets transformed into heat, because they're not <laughs> reflecting much back. That's cool. So white things would, would reflect better. Yeah, they're reflecting yeah. all the different yeah. wavelengths. That's right. Some chemicals are particularly good at absorbing different frequencies of light and reflecting others back, and they create pure colours, and many of these are used as pigments. Yeah. So that's what we're going to cover in a moment. The history of colours and pigments it goes back thousands of years. People have developed more and more pigments and colours. And with new discoveries and new pigments actually transforming the art that could be made. Mm -hmm. And some pigments were worth their weight in gold. Yeah. Or they might be reserved just for the elite people. <laughs> so the story of colour is a rich one. Would you like to begin? Mm-hmm. So we're going to start off with red. Um, this is red ochre. It gets its colour from iron molecules, so it's a bit like um, rust colour. Mm -hmm. um, they are magnetic, so point north when dried, and it lets you um, date artwork that hasn't been moved. So if you had like a cave painting, where the because it dries pointing um, wherever the magnetic North Pole um, was at that time, so you could tell when it was painted. That's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's found all over the world and often used as a body paint um, and, like I said, in cave art. So it's in a really old, ancient colour, that. It's been mm -hmm. kind of with humans almost as long as we've made art. Now we move on to Cochineal Red, um, which we chatted about this before in the podcast. Um, it's made from little insects and used as food colouring and lipstick as well as for paint. The British redcoats used it to dye their uniforms too. So they have very, very bright uniforms as most of you will know. And <laughs> they used these bugs. Yeah. It, it also um, became the third most important import from the Americas after gold and silver. Yeah. That's amazing. Because you think all the more practical materials you might bring from there yeah. or food, yeah, a colour, a pigment's more important than them. As I said, it was a much stronger red than others that had come before it, such as Carmine Lake, which was used by the Egyptians and was also made from crushed insects. <laughs> Raphael, Rembrandt and Rubens all used Canochinal as a glaze and they would layer the pigment on top of other reds like red ochre um, to increase their intensity. It might be used quite sparingly just to enhance other reds. Yeah. And uh, here's a picture of a British red coat. You can see where they get their name. But I think the most brilliant red is vermilion. It might be one of the most dangerous too. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't spill any blood, probably. Yeah, blood red, I think, is the most yeah. dangerous red. Yeah. Um, it's thought um, the Chinese were creating vermilion in the 4th century BCE, um, but it wasn't widely used in Europe until much later. Yeah, that's right. So there's a Persian alchemist, whose name I'm going to get wrong here, Jabir Inab Hayan. I apologise to him. And he described how vermilion was made in his book on colour recipes in the 700s. And he said that mercury and sulphur were mixed together forming a black compound of mercury sulphide. This was then heated and vaporized and then recondensed in the top of a flask. The vermilion was then taken out and it was ground. At first it was almost black, but as it was ground, it became redder and redder. So basically what they're trying to say is 
If you crush anything, it turns red. <laughs> yes, certainly with the insects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this Italian Renaissance artist called Sinino Sinini, brilliant Sweet. name, um, he wrote, If you were to grind it every day for 20 years, it would keep on getting better and more perfect. The more you ground it, the redder it got. It did have a couple of problems, though. One was that after a while, it could return back to its black colour. <laughs> so some old paintings, they've lost that vibrance they would have used to have yeah. had. Like if they used it on a red coat, it would be a black coat. Um, and as it was made from mercury, it is toxic. Oh, well. <laughs> on to our next colour. Orange. After red pigments, the orange ones seem a bit boring. <laughs> Many of them came from plants, like turmeric. Mm -hmm. um, the seeds of the anato plant have long been used in Central and Southern America for body paint and to colour fabric. <laughs> and turmeric is used to dye Buddhist monks' robes, which we covered on episode one. We did our first ever episode mm -hmm. just over a year ago. <laughs> Yeah, so if you want to know more about the history of turmeric, then go have a listen to our amateur first episode, although I felt quite amateur at the start of this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we move on to brown? There are lots of brown and earth colours mined from the ground or made of clays. They were often named after the location where they were found, such as Siena and Umber from Siena and Umbria in Italy. Siena. Yes, yeah, Sienna. 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 Um, <laughs> now, I'd imagine that some of these colours that they were producing back then, uh, they would have varied quite a lot when they were uh, mm -hmm. mined or when they were made. So perhaps the purest, most consistent colours would have been even more expensive than the rest. Because you could imagine an artist doing a painting and he's run out of his red or his brown or something and he needs to do some more, but he can't get an exact match. Yeah. Because he just dug it off from the earth or crossed a few insects to make it. Um, but where else can we get brown from? Cuttlefish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cuttlefish. <laughs> I think I might have mistyped that. Yeah. Cuttlefish. Cuttlefish, thank you. But there's no such thing as a flish. <laughs> no. Um, have you ever seen a cuttlefish? Um, I mean, I've seen dead ones, thingies. Have you seen the white kind yeah. of... Yeah, there. Things that budgies like eating, as you find on the beach. Yeah, so what colour do we get from cuttlefish? We get um, sepia, a light brown from their ink. So they have a light brown ink. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it looks different under water. Mm. And maybe with because water's bluey coloured when it mixes with the brown yeah. or the light. Anyway, so from orange to brown too... Yellow. <laughs> Can I do this one, please? Uh, permission granted. Thank you. Okay, this is amazing. Um, in Zambia, there's a cave near a place called Twin Rivers. And this is where they've actually found the earliest ever pigment production. And it dates back about 350 to 400,000 years. Wow. That's nearly as old as Granny. That is actually older than Granny. What? No. Yeah, yeah seriously, it is, it okay. is, it is. Um, Sorry, Granny. <laughs> And then the colours that they found um, ranged from everything from yellows to purples. And it's believed that it would have been used for body art as the earliest found cave paintings were only 35,000 years old only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what's most amazing about this discovery is that it actually predates modern humans. <laughs> so it wasn't Homo sapiens doing this, which is incredible. And it also hints... It was cave bears. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it also hints that maybe people or early sort of proto-humans back then um, had maybe some form of language or symbols that they were using. Yeah. So that's incredible. That, that's that's like, not you that's and me. That's like writing, but in pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so drawing. I, I don't think you understand how amazing I'm finding this fact. It's yeah. incredible. This is before humans. <laughs> or modern humans. Super. <laughs> um, or maybe they showed it like um, they're almost level. Uh, they might have had um, some societies, and then they, if you had yellow body paint, you were very powerful. If you had brown body paint, you might have not been so powerful, like um, a pauper. 
<laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, some of these pigments are very expensive. Yeah. So we move on to our next yellow pigment. Yeah. So what happens when you feed cows mango leaves? You can create a pigment called India Yellow from their urine or pee. <laughs> <laughs> so bovine urine. <laughs> Now, the British painter Turner, he loved this colour so much that some people said his paintings were afflicted by jaundice, which is kind of when your skin goes yellow yeah. in the eyes and things. But there's actually some debate about how true the source of Indian yellow is. Um, there's also a rather cruel practice. So not everybody thinks it yeah. was created this way, but there's some evidence to say it was. A lot of the time, it seems the pigments were actually from other sources. Yeah. Um, but wasn't it... Um, they made it by feeding cows mango leaves um, and then making them go pee pee <laughs> <laughs> um, on like a special soil or sand. And yeah. I guess, yeah. And the sand could have been a bit like the pigment. Um, yeah, so I think then they dried it and crushed it and ground yeah. it up. Yeah. And you'd imagine it would smell. That's the one thing that doesn't, um, when you grind, um, grind it. Grind it? Ground? Grind it, yeah. Um, the one thing when you, um, doesn't matter now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's our next colour? Green. I like green. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously a very important colour if you want to paint landscapes, isn't it? Yeah, you need to get the grass. <laughs> and green penguin, pigment. <laughs> green penguins. <laughs> Cuddle flesh. <laughs> um, yeah, and green pigments um, have been some of the most poisonous. Okay. That's, that's why if you have, like, poisonous liquid in a scientific lab flask... Oh, so it's always green, isn't green it? Yes. And glowy. Yeah. Um, in 1775, Swedish chemist Carl Winheim Skiel Sch Sch <laughs> invented what's known as Skiel's green. Skiel's green. Shreels green. Shreels green. Shreels green. Shreels. Why do we do things with all these complex names? I don't know. Um, <laughs> now, it was a bright green, but it was also deadly as it contained arsenic. <gasps> but that didn't stop it becoming very popular in Victorian times. Yay! So everything's popular in Victorian times. Did you know that Napoleon Bonaparte's wallpaper was... Sh 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 that green <laughs> and historians think um this might have been what killed him so he would have been breathing it in and everything not licking his walls hopefully um but <laughs> i don't know maybe he was just so and disappointed at how he'd lost his his empire had built and he was leaning against the wall with his elbow and his mm -hmm. <laughs> actually i like napoleon he doesn't seem that popular among the british but no. i listened to the napoleon podcast with cam not Ray, and the Mr. Napoleon expert man. And uh, I've grown to respect Napoleon a lot since then. Yeah. So another green is Paris green. Um, this also contained arsenic and was used by Monet and Renoir. Um, <laughs> and also as a rat poison. <laughs> um, Renoir might have used this colour when he visited Guernsey in 1883. We visited the site of several of his landscape paintings and have a short recording now. Over to you, me. So we are down at Moulin Wet now, which is a uh, lovely little bay in Guernsey. You might be able to hear the sea crashing against the rocks around us and coming up through the gullies. It's a lovely, lovely sunny day, isn't it? Yeah. And um, Renoir actually spent some time painting here, didn't he, when he visited Guernsey? Yeah, in fact, he did. He made 15 paintings in only five weeks, uh, that, in the five weeks that he spent in Guernsey. So that's pretty impressive, but it was kind of his Impressionist style, because he was an Impressionist painter. Yeah, so that allowed him to work more quickly than maybe some of the sort of Renaissance masters, yeah. things like that, with his paintings. And uh, what did we just see jumping in the bay as well? We saw tuna, um, I think it was two or three, and they all just jumped out, um, almost like dolphins yeah, <laughs> or they... gazelles in the water. <laughs> yeah, water jumping. gazelles. Yeah. Yeah, they actually leapt clear of the water, didn't they? And they're so, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're massive, they're amazing. Yeah. So that was really exciting was really to cool. see. So we're going to continue exploring. So there's actually 
uh, dotted around the bay are lots of picture frames um, which you can look through and the view that you see is the same as some of the paintings that Renoir did, isn't it? So we are exploring these at the moment. Yeah. Taking advantage of some of the fine autumn weather. Yeah, back to the studio. It was actually a lovely day, wasn't it, when we were recording yeah, then? Yeah, it was nice and sunny and it wasn't too slippery so I could climb a rock. Yes, you could. <laughs> it was kind of perfect, the way that the light was playing on the cliffs. I mean, mm. you could imagine that's what drew him to that location. I still can't believe we saw tuna jumping out of the water. Yeah. It was so cool. Yep. I, the, they're big. <laughs> yeah. So what happens to copper statues as they age? Uh, they turn greedy, sort of. Yeah, I think it's when the... Is it oxidisation that's happening there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is our next pigment. So it's a blue-green one called Vedigis, and it is made from the corrosion of copper, and it was really cheap, so popular. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a nice colour as well. It is, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this was a cheap colour, so that made it very popular. But it did have one big problem. After it's painted onto a canvas, it would actually continue to eat away at it. <laughs> so it destroy the painting. No wonder it's cheap. <laughs> yeah, so not ideal, so is it? So somebody found, found that out, they would have been like, all right, sell this for a pound. So just imagine the most amazing painting ever created is probably poisonous or corroded away to nothing. <laughs> yeah. So we've gone from blue green, so let's go on to blue, yeah. where we've got lapis lazuli. Is that how I say it? Yep. And this will be a familiar name to Minecraft players, so I'll let you do this one. It's either lapis lazuli, I think, or lapis lazuli. That's oh, nice. I like saying. Is that your special accent? <laughs> yeah. My Anton accent. Mm -hmm. Anyway. It is also the source of one of the most amazing pigments called ultramarine. Lapis lazuli is a semi precious stone and mined in. Afghanistan and crushed into powder. It is very expensive to produce and is considered more precious than gold. And in Minecraft, it probably is because then you can enchant your um, gold pickaxes and everything. Oh, okay. So, yeah. to unbreaking and then it won't break all the time. <laughs> That's what unbreaking means. Yeah. Michelangelo couldn't afford it and left a painting called The Entombment Unfinished. Vermeer got his family into debt using it. <laughs> yeah, so... It so unfortunately, a... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle couldn't finish his painting. He couldn't, no, it's very sad, actually. Yeah. He wasn't even the blue one, was he? That was Leonardo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's such an amazing colour that some artists, they would just kind of ruin themselves using it <laughs> yeah. um, when a painting was being created using it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the person who commissioned the painting, they would pay for the pigment, yeah. so it's that fiber, and it'd be decided upon with the um, artist kind of what areas of the painting would be done in ultramarine, mm -hmm. because it was so, so precious that they only could use so much of it. Yeah. But imagine if you're mixing it up and you, I know you spill it or something, or, <laughs> that would be or you run out halfway through, I mean. Like a really expensive ink or something and then you spill the pot. Yeah. That'd be annoying. Only, the ink only from um, octopus ink sack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just find it amazing how valuable these pigments were and also all mm -hmm. the places they come from and uh, how they're made and also kind of how they yeah. linked up the world. So this come from Afghanistan into Europe, yeah. kind of uh, along it's the like Spice the Raid. Silk Raid. Thank you. <laughs> I always call it the Spice Raid. <laughs> yeah, it sounds better, I guess. Or maybe it's from the brilliant game Century Spice Raid. So this is a big chunk of the rock here. See how blue it is. Yeah. I mean, it's I'd... got lots of different shades, so I guess every paint wouldn't be exactly the same um, exactly. shade. Almost, well, same with all of them, probably. Yep. But now you can get some more similar. How does that form naturally, though? It's incredible. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to our next colours. Violet and purple. Yeah, so to be born in the purple was an idiom given to the children of Byzantium emperors. And it came from the fact that it was such a rare colour. Only those deemed worthy, the ruling family, were allowed to wear it. So it must have come from somewhere pretty special. Actually, it's made from the mucus of a carnivorous sea snail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's difficult to make and has been used since at least 1200 BCE. Greek historian 
Theopompus. That's Good new. Name. That's the first easy name. <laughs> <laughs> wrote in the fourth century BCE that purple for dyes fetch their weight in silver at Colophon. They could actually milk these snails. Because <laughs> I was reading Wikipedia about this and I'm trying to think exactly how they phrased it. Something like, by agitating a snail, such as by poking it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite funny. But I remember doing my research um, for school and I came across this story where there was a dog who went um, down to the beach and they munched on a um, snail and then the dog licked its owner's leg and... Um, the owner was like, why is there purple on my leg? <laughs> and then, um, like I said, it munched on a sea snail. Maybe that's how we discovered it. I mean, how else did you find that? <laughs> Obviously. Purples became really popular in more recent times too, when I said. <laughs> yeah, when I said. No, I didn't read. Okay. <laughs> oh, I get it now. Yeah. <laughs> That could be easy. Um, purple became really popular in more recent times too. Monet said, I have finally discovered the true colour of the atmosphere. It is violet. Fresh air is violet. Although some critics of the day accused him of violetomania. <laughs> yeah. Is that real? Well, it's a mania of violet. <laughs> It should be a violetophobia. No, he's not scared of it. I know, but there should be a violetophobia. There, may, there probably is, actually. Yeah. People are scared of carnivorous sea snails. <laughs> so a lot of these colours were made possible thanks to the invention of the tube of paint. <laughs> and that was by a chap called John Goff Rand, and he invented it in 1841. And it allowed artists for the first time to take their fresh paint outside of them wherever they were going. So it helped with impressionism, didn't it? Where you can do these quick yeah. paintings out. And you could also buy pre-mixed colours as well. You could purchase them all mm -hmm. ready to go. That's good. So we have travelled from red to violet and pretty much covered all the visible light, haven't we? Yeah. But there's still two more important pigments we need to mention. Black and white. So first up, black. So how do you think it's made? There are two similar pigments, bone black and ivory black. Um, both are made by burning bones or ivory until carbonised. Um, it's then crushed up into a powder. Did you know it's also used when they refine sugar? No. <laughs> yeah, so next time you eat something sweet, just remember that. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. So what happens to your teeth if uh, they turn bone black or ivory black if you have too many seats? That's true, yeah, maybe and that's what's yucky. happening. Yeah. You've cracked it. See, I'd actually seen the name um, Bone Black before and it always confused me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know where it came from, but now I know. Now, all the pigments that we've talked about so far, they've been really old ones, haven't they? But there's an amazing new one called Vanta Black. Yeah. And it is the blackest black. Mm -hmm. It's more black than any black that's come before. <laughs> and it's actually created using carbon nanotubes mm -hmm. and it said that it absorbs up to 99.965% of all visible light. Whoa. So it's nearly everything. And if you look at it, it's meant to be like you are looking at a bottomless pit. There's no lights coming back to your eyes. Yeah. And it's meant to almost change your perception of where you are in space. Mm -hmm. And here, which I'll put this picture in the show notes, is an artwork by Anish Kapoor. And he's got the exclusive rights to use this in his artwork. So this is two busts. The left yeah. one's metal. What does the right one look like, though? That, it looks like it's just been cut out of the picture. It's um like it's same shape, but you can't see anything. You can't even see if there's like an, a nose or eyes on it. It's just black. Yeah, it's just a solid black form, isn't it? Yeah. It's incredible. I really want to see it. Okay, so onto our last colour, white. So when I was at art college, I needed to make some gesso. Um, it's kind of like a white paint or pigment, uh, which would be used as a primer on a canvas to prepare it for other paints. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think it was made of? Um, not burnt bone. No. Uh, snow. <laughs> no, that would melt. <laughs> oh. um, a plate. <laughs> no, no. It was made of rabbit skin. Nice. Yeah, I remember we were having to mix this up and it was all horrible. 
<laughs> is that, I wouldn't say I'm particularly disgusted by things, but when we made this kind of gooey, sticky thing out of rabbit skin, it, it wasn't that nice. But you know of an even worse white, don't you? Yeah. Lead white. Poisonous lead mm-hmm. white. <laughs> Artists said it would capture and reflect the gleam of light like no other white pigment. It was made in an odd way. Cow and horse manure was layered on top of lead and vinegar and left for months in um, in a sealed room. It would make pure white flakes um, then were turned into paint. Poisonous paint. How do people discover these things? But um, in Tudor times, they um, they used it as like makeup to make them look paler. Um, he was very famous for that. Elizabeth I. Yeah, and what did it do to their skin? Um, bad things. Basically, ate it, didn't it? Yeah. And made it all pockmarked and horrible. Yeah. So they must have had to put more and more on each time to cover it, like uh-huh. you're plastering a wall. <laughs> anyway, over to you. Thank you. See, I don't know how people discovered all these pigments because what we've got, we've got crushed insects. We've got... Burnt bone and crushed burnt bone. Burnt bone, yep. We've got... Rust. Mercury and acid or whatever it was. Sulfur. 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 Yes. We've got cows weighing on things. We've got s- snail mucus. We've got Afghanistan stones. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. So in pigments, you're capturing kind of the progress of human civilization and technology. Mm-hmm. Now, in 2006, around 7.4 million tons of pigments were marketed worldwide. And in 2018, the pigment market was estimated to be worth about $15 billion. So it's still very valuable today. Yeah. And we tried to make some of our own oil paint, didn't we? Mm-hmm. So which dangerous pigments did we use? So we used pastels. Pastels, yes. Yeah. Or pastels, as most people call them. Mm-hmm. Unless you are a true artist. Yes. <laughs> and we're not, so pastels. So how did we make our paints then? So we kind of grated almost um, some pastels into a powder. Um, and then we added some walnut oil, just a few drops, and then mixed it all together. And that made um, a nice paint. But when we tried white, it didn't work so well. So really, the best oil to use is linseed oil, but we couldn't get hold of mm-hmm. any of that. So walnut oil was also used by artists when they used to make paint. And the actual process is it's really time consuming, isn't it? Because our paint took a few minutes to make. But yeah. then... There must have been some longer ones. <laughs> yeah, it could take hours and hours to mix a paint. So they would have to grind up the pigments and then they'd be mixing it with an oil. And obviously for a proper painting, you want it to be fully mixed. and Plus the 10 years of training <laughs> to mix it. So an apprentice to an artist, he yeah, he might train for years before he even gets to do any painting himself. And he might just be told, okay, you can't mix paint, so you can't paint. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Or if you drop that special bit of ultramarine, <laughs> ultramarine yeah, yeah. you're at the academy, that's it. It has to be seen again. Yeah. Now, before we finish, I want to have a quick look again at the colours we can see. Uh, I mean, do colours really exist, do you think? Do we all see them the same as what I see as red, the same as what you see as red? Um... Maybe. I mean, there's colourblind people, Mm -hmm. so they might not see red. Um, And, yeah, I guess colours are real. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, really, colour is just all in our head because it's our brain interpreting light, isn't it? And signals going into our eyes. Yeah, so if you had, like, bees, they've got different colour vision. Yeah, they can see ultraviolet, can't they? Yeah, so, but everything... There's lots of different types of (laughs) colour. Or, like, how you can see colour in the world. Mm-hmm. Like we, I guess um, humans have, I you would say detailed, <laughs> um, all lots of different types of light. Um, but if you had ultraviolet light, like a bee or something, you would not have so many colours in your spectrum. Now, there's a really great talk by this rather eccentric <laughs> chap called Neil Harabison, and he can't actually see colours, so he just sees them black and white. Mm-hmm. So he had a camera embedded into the top of his skull. <laughs> and so it will film what he's looking at and it will turn the colours he's seeing into sounds. And he says, yeah. now he doesn't dress for how he looks, he dresses for how he sounds. Yeah. Um, so what's actually happened is he can now see colour because his brain actually interprets the sounds for him. Yeah. But what's most amazing 
is that he can actually now dream in colour. <laughs> his brain has adapted. That's really cool. And there's a video um, which I'll put in the show notes, which is the TED Talk by him. It's really interesting. In English, we've got 11 basic colours, and they're black, white, red, green, yellow, blue, pink, grey, brown, orange and purple. But not all cultures have this number. So there's a tribe of hunter-gatherers from probably our favourite island after Guernsey on this podcast, Papua New Guinea. And this tribe, they're called the Barimo, and they have just five basic colours in their language. Mm-hmm. And there's another nearby tribe, and they only have two basic colours, which I think is basically light and dark. Yeah. So, black, white. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's an idea in linguistics called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. And the idea behind it is that we see the world more through our language than with our eyes, okay? Mm-hmm. So if you have less words for colours, that means that you can actually distinguish or see less colours in the real world. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you actually see those colours differently. Now the Barinmo, they actually have two colours for what we would call yellow. They've yeah. got null and wow. Oh. <laughs> and so they actually see a division in yellow that we don't. So if you had a colour chart and you were asked to divide yeah. the colours up, we would just say yellow, yellow, yellow. And they'd go, no, yeah. no, wow, well, wow. Well. Yeah. When tested and asked to match colours, English speakers were much better at distinguishing between blue and green, but with yellows we were much worse than the tribe. Mm-hmm. So it's this weird idea that you will see more colours if you understand them. <laughs> so maybe that's why artists were so good and so passionate about all these pigments, because they were kind of trained in understanding colour, they could yeah, actually they see more colours. painter's eye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they've got the painter's eye. That's a good way of putting it. Dr Robertson who spent nine months with the tribe in the jungle, (laughs) uh, getting to know them and understand their culture um, and study them. She said that the Beridmo colour vision is the same as ours. If they're asked to identify a single colour from a group of colours, they would do it in the same way as you or I. But say you have three colours and call two of them blue and one green, we would see them as being more similar because we call them all by the same name. Our linguistic categories affect the way we perceive the world. So how many colours do you think we can see? Um, 10,122,502. It's very precise. How confident are you in that guess? Not very. <laughs> okay, you went a little bit too high there. Oh, so nice. in our eyes, we've got three types of cones that pick up different colours. And it's said that each one of those can probably pick up about 100 different shades of that colour. So 100 mm-hmm. times 100 times 100 is... One million. Yeah, so we can probably see one million different colours. Not that many. <laughs> I, think <if> you li- <laughs> I think if you line them up, you think that's a lot. Okay. Uh, but there are some people in the world who might actually be able to see some more. And you mentioned colourblind people earlier. Mm-hmm. Some women who have a colourblind father actually have an extra fourth cone in their eyes. Yeah. And this might allow them to see 100 million colours. <sighs> to us, what might look like a white wall, to yeah. them would look like a really different coloured tones of white wool. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, but it's a world that most of us can't see. So, And then they'll be like, oh, can you colour me what you see? <laughs> like, draw what you see. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't even be able to see their colours. Yeah. Imagine um, like a um, like a manager of a pen or colouring um, manufacturer um, who's like a special person like this. And then... You, that would be like, all right, I want this colour. And everybody else would think it's a completely different colour. Yeah, it could be really frustrating as well. Yeah. We, um, imagine somebody's cleaned something and to them it looks perfect. Mm-hmm. And, um, consistent colour. And to you it's like, ooh. Yeah. But some people have less um, like colour senses. Less um, colour blind people. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So they would have one of them malfunctioning. So they only get two okay. of the colours. So people with four functioning canes are called tetrachromats. Tetra mm-hmm. being four, whilst us mere mortals are trichromats. So <laughs> tri meaning three. Yeah. How do you think you say this person's name? J. Neats. 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 So, <laughs> J. Neats, a vision researcher at the University of Washington, says that we might actually need to create special colours for these people to allow them to practice how to use their additional canes. Mm-hmm. So think of it a bit like exercising a muscle. Mm-hmm. And he says... Most things we see as coloured are manufactured by people who are trying to make colours that work for trichromats. It could be that our whole world is tuned to the world of the trichromat. So in other words, the colours we create 
and use uh, mean that the fourth cone never gets a workout. Yeah. It would be interesting to see the art of a trained tetrachromat um, who has made art um, for themselves with their own kind of special colours mm -hmm. and see if if you can just... <laughs> See so if you can notice if there's like, hey, I don't recognise that red or I'm not sure. Yeah, or it could be a, an exclusive um, exhibition for tetrachromats where mm. they can see yeah. things in the paintings that nobody else can. Yeah. Good for spies, maybe, as well, with like hidden oh, messages yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, then you could do a slightly different shade of white on another white um, for special tetrachromats. Yeah. Thingies. You're welcome, all of the organizations <laughs> i think it's possible to understand why artists would become so enraptured by different pigments and why they're so viable and kind of why we went to such extreme lengths and invented all these crazy ways to produce pigments mm -hmm. um particularly when half of them would kill us <laughs> <laughs> that's nice so like the tribe that can't see the difference between green or blue or the super seers who view the world in a way that's impossible for the rest of us to perceive color has always been so important to us. From the beginnings of human existence, these pigments have allowed us to make marks and to understand the world and to create and to communicate. So what do you think would happen tomorrow if someone discovered an entirely new colour? Um, not much, but the day after, I think everybody would know about it. <laughs> Once they put it on the news. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be visible on the news. We'd have to have whole dun, new TVs dun, dun. or computers to see it. Yeah. And that is colour and pigment. Yeah, that was cool. It's amazing, I think. Mm -hmm. I still don't get how people invent these things. What sick, crazy people do this? <laughs> because they've got to be. No the, sane the, person the ones, would do it. The ones who accidentally made um, arsenic and lead paint and then ate the paint. Yeah. <laughs> when Kind of sending their brush. <laughs> I guess at the time um, we knew that some of these things were poisonous. Mm -hmm. Yet that need and that desire yeah. to use this pigment and create that artwork and have these beautiful colours was more important than life. <laughs> yeah. Really, wasn't it? Insane. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the show. That is the end of the show. That's our one year anniversary episode. And uh, I hope it went okay. <laughs> we stumbled a few times in recording, yeah. didn't we? And we're going to be back onto our Halloween special next time. And I've got an idea. Another one. Yay. Yeah, I've got a special treat for you. Yay. You know how you taste spices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there might be something else for you to eat. <laughs> and it won't be... Pleasant. <laughs> yeah, it won't be pleasant, exactly. It won't be Halloween treats. So, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show and learned something. We always thank do, you. don't we? Thank you for listening. Bye. We're not going quiet yet. Thank you for not listening. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye no. Thank you for listening and not bye. Um, so please, please, please review us on Podchaser or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to um, this, show. this show. Thank you. And you can follow us on Twitter at Curie Child Pod. And where's our website? Uh, uh, um, uh, on any good web browser. Yep, I recommend Firefox. <laughs> um, you can find us at thecuriosityofachild.com. And I also started work on some merchandise, so look Yay. out for that soon. Yay. So thank We're you very much. We're getting t shirts. We're getting t shirts. Do, We're do, getting do, do, t shirts do, do. and mugs. Yeah, and possibly shower curtains. <laughs> as another podcast is a shower curtain. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Emoji. When you have nothing to listen to.